At lunchtime on Tuesday, May the 5th, 1953, a small silver aircraft was observed circling over the River Thames near Waterloo Bridge. It carefully descended towards the river and then flew under Waterloo Bridge, Westminster Bridge and continued westbound, in total flying under 15 bridges. The pilot was 61-year-old Christopher Draper. Christopher Draper was born in 1892 at Bebbington on the Wirral. His father was a leather trader in Liverpool, although that business later failed when a partner embezzled the spare capital. After an unremarkable schooling, Draper was apprenticed to the Lawton Motor Company in Liverpool, although this was terminated a year or so later when his father couldn't afford the fees. The young Christopher drifted in and out of a variety of jobs, including chauffeuring. He first saw an aeroplane in December 1909 when he helped Samuel Cody rig his aeroplane in Liverpool for an unsuccessful flight to Manchester. Draper, desperate to learn to fly but with no money to do so, wrote to Sir Joseph Holt. Sir Joseph, a shipping owner, local MP and noted philanthropist, gave Draper £210 on the understanding he didn't tell anyone else. Draper took the train south on his first visit to London and signed up to the Claude Graham White Flying School at Hendon. After three and a quarter hours flying time, Christopher Draper was awarded Royal Aero Club Certificate number 646. He paid for an extra three hours of solo flying at £10 an hour, but found that even with a whopping six hours flying time, he couldn't find a flying job. His cousin Bertie, himself a Royal Navy officer, told Draper that the Royal Naval Air Service were offering commissions to holders of Royal Aero Club certificates. Draper applied, was accepted, and was sent to Uphaven in Wiltshire for pilot training. The Central Flying School at Uphaven had been formed by the Royal Navy in 1912. It trained pilots for the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps. One of Draper's contemporaries was Captain Hugh Dowding, later head of fighter command during the Battle of Britain. Training was carried out on Farnham Shorthorns and Avros, and by the end of April 1914, Draper had gained his pilot's wings and several summons for speeding from the Wiltshire Constabulary. His first posting was to East Church on the Isle of Grain in Kent. When the First World War broke out, Draper was sent north to the new air station at Whitley Bay, just north of Newcastle. His next posting took him to Dundee, to where his curious taste for bridges began. The rail bridge over the River Tay is over two miles long and has 85 arches. Draper amused himself by flying repeatedly through the bridge arches, on one occasion flying through 29. In 1916, Draper was sent to France. On his way south, he stopped at Brooklands to pick up a new Sopwith one and a half strutter. On departure, he flew under the members' bridge that spanned the racetrack. Tommy Sopwith was delighted, less so Harry Hawker. That was his party piece. Draper scored his first four victories in a one and a half strutter, and two more in a Newport 24. In 1917, he was made squadron commander of Naval 8, scoring his last three victories in Sopwith Camels. An extract from Draper's logbook makes for interesting reading. Not suitable for instructional work, a brilliant pilot, but a very bad example for young pilots. One has to remember they were fighting a war, not running a kindergarten. On the 1st of April 1918, the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps were combined to form a new service, the Royal Air Force, under Sir Hugh Trenchard, Chief of the Air Staff. This change was by no means universally popular, but Naval 8 became 208 Squadron, RAF. In this Christmas 1918 photograph, Draper in the centre with a dog, Lieutenant Botterill on the left, are both wearing their old RNAS uniforms. Draper left the service in May 1919, and after a short period of time selling cars, joined the British Aerial Transport Company as Chief Test Pilot. He carried out the first flight and development of the FK-26 airliner, designed by Frederick Kuhlhoven and powered by a Rolls-Royce Eagle engine. Draper also carried out the one and only flight of the BAT Crow. This curious device, the propeller designed to maim the pilot if he leant forward, was powered by a Nat Aero engine and was not a success, as the Nat was very unreliable. In March 1920, Draper, suffering with a heavy flu, was demonstrating the Bat Bantam fighter at Hendon. He got into a flat spin and hit the ground. Onlookers thought it fatal, but he was dragged out of the wreckage with a broken ankle, broken nose 
and missing a few teeth. By the time he was fit enough to fly again, the company had been dissolved. Fortunately, the Royal Air Force were recruiting and he rejoined as a squadron leader. Draper led the first RAF formation aerobatic team, which displayed at Hendon in 1921 in front of their majesties, the King and Queen. Shortly after the pageant, Draper was sent to number no. five flight training school at RAF Shotley near Chester to be head of flying. He enjoyed it at first, but noted a peacetime fuss for red tape and endless discipline had rather taken the place of flying and in a fit of pique resigned his commission in October 1921. After a brief spell delivering war surplus de Havilland aircraft for the aircraft disposal company of Croydon, Draper didn't fly again for another 10 years. Instead, he became a jobbing actor with the pseudonym George Mannering, and for a while, a wine merchant's clerk in Singapore. By 1930, Draper's career was failing. He needed to do something to raise the profile of George Mannering. Providence sent something his way. He'd called in to see his old friend, Francis St. Barb. They had lodged together when learning to fly at Hendon in 1913, and by now St. Barb was a director of the de Havilland Aircraft Company. St. Barb offered Draper a go in a new puss moth. Draper found it easy to fly. It was the ideal aircraft for his cunning plan. On the 30th of September 1931, Draper took off in a puss moth from Stag Lane Aerodrome. The wind was light at the aerodrome, but not nearly as good down on the River Thames. He managed to fly through Tower Bridge and under Westminster Bridge, which was into wind with the southerly breeze, but couldn't attempt any more bridges. George Mannering had certainly raised his profile. At the subsequent court proceedings, the presiding magistrate was surprised to learn that Draper couldn't find work. Rather than fine him, he bound him over to keep the peace for 12 months. Major Oliver Stewart, aeronautical correspondent for the Morning Post, penned an article entitled the Mad Major returns to town. The Mad Major was an apocryphal figure from the First World War, who the Tommies cheered as he shot up the Hun trenches. The press, public and Draper all took to this name immediately. A legend was born. William Forbes Sempill, the master of Sempill, was looking for a British ace to join his Aces of the Air lecture tour. With nine confirmed kills, Draper was an ace and, as an actor, had no issues with public speaking. The four aces are seen here. From left to right, they are Gunther von Richthofen, a grumpy cousin of the Red Baron, Draper, Major Edward Ritter von Schley, a German ace with 34 kills and the Blue Max to his credit, and Major Alan Bridgman. Bridgman was an unremarkable RSC officer who'd just been through a messy divorce and needed some cash. The purpose of the tour was to promote Anglo-German friendship Certainly Draper and von Schley became firm friends. Draper, in his various guises, continued to make good copy, and in 1935 he appeared in the film King of the Damned as a pilot. Hello, this is mail plane S224 calling the island of Santa Maria. I'm making a special call to refuel and land the passenger. Can I come in, please? Draper also started flying again, banner towing behind a Wolseley Viper powered Avro. In late 1932, Draper was invited by his friend von Schley to visit Munich. Von Schley was vehemently anti-communist and was an early and enthusiastic member of the Nazi party. During that visit, Draper was introduced to Adolf Hitler, whom he spoke to for about 30 minutes through an interpreter. Shortly after returning from Munich, Draper was contacted by Dr. Hans Faust, British correspondent for the Nazi newspaper Der Volkisch Bierbachter, and asked if he would give a series of lectures promoting German interests. Motivated both by the three guineas per lecture fee and a genuine desire to promote peaceful cooperation, Draper agreed. Barely half a dozen lectures took place, the British public having little time for the Germans or their ideology. Some months later, Dr. Faust contacted Draper again and asked if he would spy for Germany. 
Draper agreed to this, but through a friend contacted MI5 and was interviewed by Sir Vernon Kell. Shortly afterwards, Draper travelled to Hamburg to meet his handler. The name is not recorded, but it was probably noted Abwehr agent Hilmar Dirks. For the next four years, Draper fed the Germans useless information in exchange for cash, which MI5 let him keep. As Britain's only double agent at the time, his communications with the Germans gave MI5 valuable information about Abwehr fieldcraft. This led to the capture of Arthur Owens, a treacherous Welshman, in 1936, and helped with the capture of Jesse Jordan, an equally treacherous Scot, the following year. By 1937, the Germans had ended all contact with Draper, probably suspecting he was a double agent. The following year, he was named as a German spy at a trial in New York. This information was a plant, probably supplied by the Abwehr. It caused quite a stir in the press, and MI5, under the guise of the Air Ministry, were forced to issue a statement on behalf of Draper. In September 1939, immediately after war had been declared, Draper rejoined the Royal Navy as a sub-lieutenant. He was posted to Ford Aerodrome in Sussex as assistant armaments officer. Unfortunately, the baby Austin didn't have as many lives as its master, being destroyed in an air raid. Soon he was unofficially flying a Percival Proctor, thanks to a benevolent station commander. In May 1940, aged 48, Draper returned to full flying duties. The following year he was appointed squadron commander of 777 Naval Air Squadron at Hastings Aerodrome in Sierra Leone. 777 was a fleet requirements unit operating various aircraft types on different tasks. It was Draper's last flying post. The squadron was disbanded in December 1944 and he finished the war a staff officer. He was demobilised in May 1945. Like many former servicemen, Draper struggled to find a role in post-war Britain. Jobbing actor, hotel storekeeper, a bit of consultancy, it didn't add up to much. And by 1953, Draper had been unemployed for over a year. He had a plan which a friend thought so hilarious that he wrote Draper a cheque. Hiring an oster from the Hearts and Essex Aero Club at Broxbourne, he once again headed for the river. This time conditions were perfect. A photographer was taking photographs of repairs to Big Ben. He captured this fine image of Draper emerging from Westminster Bridge. The plan had been to fly under 18 bridges, but Draper discounted three on the day, considering it unsafe to fly under them. The flight didn't take long, Draper headed back to Broxbourne, where, inevitably, the telephone was already ringing. Whilst Draper celebrated what was surely his last flight, news of his escapade spread. Once again, the Mad Major had returned to town. I'm not sure that the comment by the Queen was anything to do with Draper, but I'd like to think that Philip approved. Draper was interviewed by the police, and in due course, summoned on four charges. He had reason to be worried. Frank Miller, seen here with Draper in 1951, had been fined £100 after flying an Oster through Tower Bridge. But the old rascal Draper got away with it again. He was discharged from court after paying 10 guineas costs. His pilot's licence was suspended, but that was given back the following year. Best of all, he was offered several jobs. Draper continued to appear in the newspapers and on television quite regularly. He got into a little bit of trouble in 1959 when he tried to circle Eros, the statue in the middle of Piccadilly Circus, 100 times in a Messerschmitt bubble car. Fortunately, the Mayor of London was an old squadron pal of Draper's and thought the whole thing rather amusing. His autobiography was published in 1962, and in 1963 he was filmed and interviewed at Biggin Hill. Hello, Major. How does it feel to be up in the air again? 
Oh, terrific. Uh, very much like it always has been with me, I'm afraid. I'm a bit of an old hand at it. <laughs> there can't be many pilots with a 1913 licence who are still flying. Are you the only one? No, as far as I know, there's one other. That is Cecil Pashley at Shoreham. Why particularly you do want to keep a valid flying licence? Well, this is my golden jubilee of the time I first had a licence. Uh, not because you've got some spectacular new plan in mind. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not a lawbreaker any longer. <laughs> Christopher Draper stopped flying in 1964, by which time he'd flown over 17,000 hours. He died in 1979, aged 86. Thank you for watching.